greetings. This odd little box was given to me by a friend of mine to, uh, to take a look at. It's a mains inverter. It's an old mains inverter. There's no model number on the front or back. It's just got this logo which looks like an SAC. I've searched for the logo, but I can't find any trace of it. Google Images doesn't recognize it. Yandex doesn't recognize it. There's a company called SAC Electronics, which was established in 1955, but they sell aerial distribution gear. A normal 13 amp main socket on the front, on off switch, fuse, and two cables which run to a 12 volt battery, such as this one. It's quite noisy when there's no load on it, but it's pretty quiet when it does have a load, such as this lamp. Although the waveform is pretty horrible, it's practically a square wave. Also, the, the output voltage is quite low. Although, if you do take the lamp off, that does go quite high. Anyway, let's take a look inside. Well, I knew it was old, but I didn't know it was that old. This has got a date on it of 24th September 1979, and it was repaired on what looks like the 13th of October 1980. I was six when this was born. As you can see, there's one large transformer and three boards. These are all for, they're not strip boards as far as I can tell. They're just, uh, they're just perf board. And there are two of those with a solder tag board at the bottom. At the back then we've got this transistor. We'll find out what that is in a moment. And around right the front, we've got a a switch which is controlling the supply uh, to the inverter rather than the, the AC output and that's protected by a fuse which is rated at uh, whatever that is <laughs> uh, yeah it's protected with a length of fuse wire that's just been stuffed in the hole that's clever Around this side we've got a yellow wire here which is just used just to wrap all these connections down, doesn't actually go anywhere, it's just used to tie these together. And that's all there is to see inside. Let's see if I can trace it out and then figure out how it works. Right, I've drawn out the schematic and it's helped me work out what each of these boards does. The top board has two rolls. A minor job is to hold these polarity protection diodes. These are connected in reverse across the incoming battery supply. If the battery connections are reversed, they'll short out the supply and pop the fuse. This is more economical than having them in series with the supply, as they'd be dropping the supply voltage slightly and getting very hot in the process. I've seen the same setup in a CB radio, so I guess it's a pretty standard way of doing it. The main job of the top board is to shut off power when the supply voltage gets too low. It's got two outputs, one connects to the negative side of the red LED, the other drops down to the middle board. How it appears to work is this. When the voltage is high enough, Q1 is switched on, dragging the emitter voltage of Q2 up above its base voltage and shutting it off. With Q2 off, the base of Q3 stays high, and as it's a PNP transistor, that stays off as well. With that off, the gate of thyristor Q4 stays low, keeping the LED cathode and the enable outputs high. As the supply voltage falls, Q1 will start to turn off allowing the emitter voltage of Q2 to fall. Once it goes below the base voltage, Q2 will start to turn on. That will pull the base of Q3 down, and that will start to turn on. That will raise the gate voltage of Q4. Once that triggers, it'll pull the LED cathode down, turn the LED on, and pull down the enable output. And as it's an SCR, it's going to stay there. You can see that in action on the scope here. I don't need to use a bench power supply for this, as the battery is not going to hold out for long. The middle board has the shut-off transistor, which is shut down by the top board when the battery is too low. It's also got what appear to be two oscillator circuits. There's a triple five running as an oscillator, with its frequency adjusted by VR2. But the output from that is going to what appears to be another oscillator circuit. To me it looks like this circuit would oscillate quite happily without the triple five sticking its oar in. Now, I'm not 100% certain about Q6, as there are no markings on the front, just Malaysia and 186 on the back 
with the pinout confirmed by desoldering it and checking it on my transistor tester. Could one of these two have been replaced in the 1980 repair job? Who knows? As you can see the specifications are very similar between a BC186 and a BC212. In fact they're also similar to the BCY70 used on the top board. So they probably could have easily simplified the parts list and used the same transistor for all three. To figure out what's going on here I've used the schematic to rebuild the oscillator circuit on this breadboard. We have the triple five over here and we have the twin transistor oscillator over here. The triple five puts out this 100 hertz square wave which makes for a very interesting wave at the far end of the capacitors which is actually now 40 volts peak to peak although not as strange as it appears if you ramp the volt the frequency right up like that that's what you get if you bump it up to two and a half kilohertz the end result, which is what gets fed into the four power transistors, is this 50 Hz signal with two opposing phases, one for each transistor pair. But what happens if the triple five isn't involved? If those capacitors are left floating, it just stops oscillating. With the capacitors grounded, still doesn't oscillate, but occasionally a toggle between negative and positive will cause the two to switch state like that. So it looks like I was wrong about the circuit being able to self oscillate. Back to the unit itself and finally we have the bottom board. Between this and the two TIP3055 transistors on the rear heatsink this is where all the heavy lifting takes place. These transistors, along with a pair of TIP31A transistors on the bottom board, are connected to two opposing windings on the transformer, alternately pulling the transformer in opposite directions to induce the high voltage on the output winding. The oscillator feeds the TIP31s, which in turn feed the TIP3055s, which on their own don't have a particularly high gain. The transformer connections look a little odd, with the smaller TIP31s at the very far end of the winding and the big TIP3055 slightly further in, Again, according to my transistor tester, which mapped out the pins. But that's the way it appears to be done. I may as well probe the last places to probe on here, which are the collectors of the TIP31A and the TIP3055, where they come from the transformer, to see how they differ from that wave from, from the oscillator. And that's another flat battery. These TIP3055s, have a power dissipation rating of 90 watts, but I don't think that's such an issue here, as in this circuit they're either fully on, with a very low voltage across them, or fully off, with very low current going through them. A more important figure is the maximum collector current of 15 amps, which on a 12 volt supply would equate to this being able to handle up to 180 watts, assuming they can't cope with 30 amps at the 50% duty cycle they're running at. That's the theory though. In practice it's likely to be a lot lower, not least because transformers of this physical size appear to be around the 100 watt range. The remnants of fuse I managed to extract from the fuse holder were rated at 8 amps. If the original fuse was indeed 8 amps, then 100 would be about right, give or take a few watts. Unfortunately I don't have any 8 amp fuses, the biggest 20 by 5 fuses I have are 6.3 amp. So for testing this, they'll have to do. And that's it. Apparently that's how you built a mains inverter in 1979. I hope someone's found that interesting, perhaps it's inspired you to build your own inverter instead of just buying a lighter, smaller and more efficient switch mode one from the internet. Thanks very much for watching.